This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidu Ewart. It's Monday, December 9th. This is Africa 54. Tonight, we begin our broadcast with a new weapon being used in the fight against malaria on the island of Zanzibar. In the village of Cheju, in particular, drones are spraying a silicon-based liquid on large stretches of stagnant water in rice paddies where malaria-carrying mosquitoes lay their eggs. VOS Maria Madialo reports on how the country is using the new method to combat the disease. Drones like this are spraying a silicon solution across standing water, forming a thin layer that will eventually prevent mosquito eggs from hatching. Dr. Bart Knowles is a medical entomologist and the lead researcher working with the Zanzibar Malaria Elimination Program. He says this method will significantly reduce the number of the malaria-carrying mosquitoes in the area. This will last for around three weeks, maybe four weeks, and after that, the biological control agent, the film, will break down by itself. And then you apply, after a month, you apply a new film on the water surface and you have more control of mosquitoes. Without the gel, the larva would have become adult mosquitoes in search of a blood meal. When those mosquitoes bite humans infected with malaria, they become vectors for the disease and continue the deadly transmission cycle. Along the Indian Ocean coast of East Africa, Zanzibar and mainly Tanzania have had a long battle with malaria. Using drones is the best way to tackle the problem, says Abdullah Ali from the Zanzibar Malaria Elimination Program. With the manual kind of intervention, then you will not be able to cover the wider area. But this one is going to be different. Officials say drone spraying is a relatively inexpensive way to stop the mosquitoes from reproducing. Guido Welter is with the Drone for Malaria project. A drone can fly with the speed we adjust. Uh, one hectare within uh, 10 liters would be three minutes. Uh, we calculated that within one hour we can spray eight hectares. That's equivalent to the size of eight rugby fields. The product program manager for DJI Agris Drones, Eduardo Rodriguez, say while the drones can operate in manual mode, they can also do the job automatically. We can also fly into a fully autonomous fly mode where the pilot, knowing the GPS coordinates and knowing the, 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 the area that needs to be sprayed, can select that area, can input a few flying and spraying parameters and literally press two buttons. According to the World Health Organization, Aquatane AMF, the product being sprayed, is safe and effective when used according to the directions on the labels. Maria Magalu, VOA News, Washington. In southern Africa, Victoria Falls is in the midst of the worst drought in a century, slowing the waterfalls. The local tourist trade is being heavily affected. Adam Reed reports. For decades, stunning views from the Victoria Falls on the edge of southern Africa's Zambezi River have drawn millions of holidaymakers to Zimbabwe and Zambia. But now the worst drought in a century has slowed the waterfalls to a trickle, fueling fears that climate change could kill one of the region's biggest tourist attractions. It's normal for every season to be dry like that, but this season is started as early as June. So this is one of the, I would say, it's the longest dry season we've ever had here at the Victoria Falls. Data from the Zambezi River Authority shows water flow is at its lowest since 1995 and well under the long-term average. Scientists, though, are cautious about categorically blaming climate change as there's always seasonal variation in levels. More immediately, locals are hoping that the falls start to flow again soon as they rely heavily on tourist trade passing through. The business not been as good as it used to be, yes. So... We just hope that this season we are going to have good rains and then we are going to have a lot of people here at the Victoria Falls. 
The drought has also caused power cuts across Zimbabwe and Zambia, as they're reliant on hydropower from plants at the Kariba Dam, which is upstream of the waterfalls. Stretches of this kilometre-long natural wonder are currently nothing but dry stone, and water flow is dramatically low in others. As world leaders gather in Madrid for the United Nations COP25 climate change summit, southern Africa is already suffering some of its worst effects. With taps running dry, some 45 million people are in need of food aid amid widespread crop failures. That was Adam Reid of Reuters reporting. Activists say an East African UNESCO World Heritage Site is under threat on Kenya's remote island of Lamu. Authorities are constructing major projects on the mainland, including a port, an oil pipeline, and transport links. They are also hoping to build the region's first coal-fired power plant. But some Lamu residents worry the development and a flood of outsiders will affect the local culture. Rudy Almendor reports from Lamu. The remoteness of Kenya's Lamu Island has helped maintain its 650-year-old Swahili culture and traditions. Cars are banned in Lamu town, a UN World Heritage Site, so donkeys are the main mode of transport. But some locals worry construction of a new port, oil pipeline and transport links on the mainland will bring more outsiders to settle in Lamu and change the unique culture. Uh, we are trying our best to prevent uh, that kind of uh, intervention or sort of the kind of uh, uh, new development uh, so that we, we can preserve the Lamu. Authorities say the $26 billion group of projects will improve economic links between Kenya, South Sudan and Ethiopia and create thousands of jobs. But a Kenyan court in June halted construction of a coal-fired power plant that was to help fuel the projects, encouraging opponents. We as Lamo people are afraid because when people come from other areas, they come with many things. Their own language, their own culture, I mean their own uh, way of living. And this might alter the cultural way that people have been living. Fishermen who are concerned about the impact on their catch oppose the port construction. How they have done outside is terrible. To break all the rock where we support to go to fishing, we cannot anymore. So when the time of the season is finished, it's a rain season, you can't go anywhere to fishing now. Activists worry the projects could also thwart efforts to preserve Lamu town and its unique character. More than a third of Lamu's historic buildings are already falling apart, says the National Museums of Kenya. Some of the owners do not want to to, to to any kind of intervention. They think perhaps by putting money into their building, perhaps you may, you are actually owning it. You are taking over uh, that particular building. So it's, it's a very complex uh, kind of thing. Lamu authorities vow they will protect the island's world heritage from the projects. We have also put measures to ensure that the lapsed activities will remain on the mainland of Lamu, that is Hindi area, Mokowe and the likes. And that's the Lamu archipelago, that is Lamu Island, starting from Shela all the way to Kipungani, remains with its status of heritage. Lamu authorities say they are organizing funds to help renovate historic buildings and develop the economy with tourism as a major pillar. At the risk of commercializing their culture, some argue bringing in more tourists may actually help keep Lamu's unique traditions alive. Ruth Almondor for VOA News, Lamu, Kenya. Supporters of Nigerian journalist and human rights activist Omoyele Soware attempted to drag him away from security service agents during a court hearing on Friday. Sawari's lawyer says the government has filed new charges against the activist without giving further details. Here's Matthew Larotonda. A leading activist and former presidential candidate in Nigeria has been re-arrested just hours after he was released from custody. 
Omoyele Sawori was at a court hearing after he'd posted bail. Reuters watched his supporters desperately try to drag him away from agents of the state security service. His lawyer says he was detained shortly after. Sawori made this statement before his arrest. If suspects who have been given bail are not safe in court, the judges themselves are not safe. That is why the judge had to retire hurriedly into a chamber. So we urge you guys to hang around so that you can witness this. This is a historical day in Nigeria. Sawori was first jailed in August on charges of treason, money laundering, and harassing President Muhammadu Buhari. He's pled not guilty to all of it, and civil rights groups have protested his treatment. On Friday, his lawyer said the state had filed new charges against him, but didn't elaborate. Matthew Larotonda of Reuters with that report. Now, the largest concentration of black African churches outside of Africa can be found in South London. Each week, about 20,000 people attend one of the mostly Pentecostal churches in the city. Mark van der Wolf has more from the British capital. There's prayer, but also lots of singing and dancing. About 20,000 people attend African churches in South London every week, mostly Pentecostal. House of Praise is one of these majority black African churches, and the connection to the continent plays an important part in the community. It gives you a, a slice of home, so your parents raise you up um, in a certain culture, and sometimes you can feel a bit alienated um, outside or somewhere else, and um, it just feels like home, really. And we have a soup kitchen. We go out to feed the homeless. Um, we have a clothes bank as well during this period. Um, so in that sense, it's very important for maybe community members. Many English churches seem to have a declining congregation. Public theology lecturer David Murr says diaspora churches stand out for several reasons. First and foremost, the diversity of these churches. I mean, some churches have got uh, 20 people, some have got maybe six, but of course of other churches with 600 plus. So the kind of diversity of those churches is one thing. The second thing is that most of these churches are actually keen to get involved in social action, and they tend to do that in terms of things like education and uh, welfare. But I think what I found um, very interesting in the churches is the way in which they take uh, mission seriously. A lot of these folks feel that God has actually sent them here to evangelize the um, local um, population. There are over 240 African diaspora churches in South London, the largest concentration outside of the continent. But the diaspora and the local English churches are not very integrated yet. At House of Praise, over 80% has African heritage. We are kind of the seed that was sown by those who brought the gospel earlier on. We are kind of the fruits of those seeds we are bringing back and trying to bring back into the center of everything that is done. Many of the majority black churches do not own traditional church buildings themselves. House of Praise bought a former bingo hall to host its congregation. Others use schools or community centers. Perhaps the lack of space in London might in the future be a factor that will integrate local and diaspora churches. Marta van der Wolf for VOA News, London. South Africa's Zozibini Tunzi, 24, was crowned as the 2019 Miss Universe winner Sunday night in Atlanta, Georgia. Tunzi, a model, becomes the third representative from South Africa to win the coveted title. She was born in Solo, Eastern Cape, and graduated with a degree in public relations from the Cape Peninsula University of Technology. Other finalists hailed from Mexico and Puerto Rico. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, the NBA looks to open play with clubs, teams across Africa. We'll be back.
I'm Clara Frank, and here's what's trending. Babatunde Kasumu has been building a career as an illusionist and magician in Lagos, Nigeria, over the last three years. The 19-year-old, whose street name is Babs Cardini, says he took an interest in magic when he was a child and loved watching illusionists on TV. Today, the magician uses his bag of tricks to entertain fans at various events in the city and has a fan base of over 55,000 followers on Instagram. Cardini holds a diploma in computer engineering and is planning to study robotic engineering in the future. Next up, Tunisian students gather to participate in the eco-friendly challenge Hack for Earth, a one-day hackathon in which technology meets ecology. The challenge was hosted on Zindi, a data science competition platform in Africa. The goal of the challenge was to use the data provided by local conservationists to help them predict the number of Kenyan sea turtles that they can save each week, thus providing the necessary funds and equipment in time. The data will be used by the local ocean conservation program as part of their bycatch release program, which saves turtles, tags them, and then releases them back into the ocean. And finally, pop superstar Taylor Swift earned the top spot on Forbes magazine's list of the wealthiest musicians this year with $185 million in earnings. Kanye West came in second with $150 million, but much of his proceeds derived from sales of his Yeezy sneakers, Forbes reported. Newcomers to the list included Korean pop band BTS, who ranked 15th with $57 million in earnings. As a whole, the 10 highest paid musicians in the world took in just over $1 billion pre-tax, which is a bump of $114 million from 2018, according to Forbes. And that's what's trending today. The FBI has confirmed that the shooter at a U.S. Navy base in Pensacola, Florida on Friday was 21-year-old Saudi Air Force officer Mohammed Al-Shamrani, who was a student at the Naval Aviation School command at the base. The agency says it has yet to determine the motive for the shooting spree, but it is investigating the shooting as an act of terrorism. Buis Ladzahok reports the Saudi government is pledging to fully cooperate with the investigation. Three Naval Academy students were killed and eight other people were injured after Al-Shamrani opened fire Friday morning at the Naval Air Academy in Pensacola. Officials say the three were killed while trying to stop the shooter and that their action saved lives of many others. The FBI said Sunday the investigators are still working to determine the shooter's motive. While there are many reports circulating regarding the shooter's motivation, and his alleged activities leading to his attack, I can tell you that we are looking very hard at uncovering his motive. And I would ask for patience so we can get this right. Investigators also are trying to determine if the Saudi officer acted alone or as part of a terrorist plot. We are, as we do in most active shooter investigations, work with the presumption that this was an act of terrorism. This allows us to take advantage of investigative techniques that can help us more quickly identify and then eliminate any additional potential threats to the rest of our community. The FBI thanked the Saudi government for its pledge of full and complete cooperation. U.S. President Donald Trump said Friday that King Salman of Saudi Arabia had called him to express his condolences. The king said that the Saudi people are greatly angered by the barbaric actions of the shooter and that this person in no way, shape or form represents the feelings of the Saudi people who love the American people so much. News media reported that the shooter, who was also killed in the incident, had hosted a dinner party days before the shooting where he showed videos of mass shootings to his guests. He also visited New York City recently. No arrests have been made in the case, but several Saudi students who knew al-Shamrani have been restricted to the base by their commanding officer and are cooperating with investigators. 
The shooting at the Pensacola Naval Air Station is the second deadly shooting at a U.S. naval facility this week. A U.S. sailor shot three civilians at a base in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, Wednesday, killing two of them before committing suicide. Acting Secretary of Defense Mark Esper said he had ordered a review of the Department of Defense's security and vetting policies. Zlarisa Hoek, VO News, Washington. It's time for Monday Sports Update and joining us now is a sports reporter, Sandy Shamari. Hello, Sandy. Hello, Esther. What's happening in sports today? Hello, what is happening, Esther? And we have breaking news in sports on Monday. Russia has been handed a four-year global ban from all major sporting events by the bold anti-doping agency. Here again is Adam Reid. Russia has been banned from competing in a host of major sporting events for the next four years including the Summer and Winter Olympics, as well as the 2022 Soccer World Cup. The decision was taken on Monday by the World Anti-Doping Agency, which took action to punish Russia for manipulating laboratory data, a WADA spokesman said. WADA's executive committee met in Lausanne, Switzerland, after it concluded that Moscow had planted fake evidence and deleted files linked to positive doping tests that could have helped identify drug cheats. The committee's decision to punish Russia with a ban was unanimous, a spokesman said. The punishment does leave the door open for clean Russian athletes to compete at major sporting events without their flag or anthem for four years. WADA says Russia's own anti-doping agency has 21 days to appeal against the decision. If it does so, the appeal will then be referred to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Reuters Adam Reid reporting. And Manchester City's coach Pep Guardiola is contemplating if his side is ready to compete with the top teams in Europe after losing 2-1 against the Manchester United Red Devils in the Premier League on Saturday. This was their fourth loss in the league so far and left the defending champions in the third position. That is 14 points behind the leaders, Liverpool or the Reds. Guardiola's team was ripped apart by United on the counter-attack and they looked a shadow of the side that won the domestic treble last season. That is the level we face against Liverpool, United, Barcelona, Madrid, Juventus. They are the teams we have to face, and the reality is maybe we're not able now to compete with them, Guardiola told Sky Sports. City's backline has been ravaged by injury, with Guardiola fielding defensive midfielder Fernando in central defense in recent games. And the Basketball Africa League kicks off next year as the world governing body for basketball and the NBA look to open play with a dozen club teams across the continent. 50 aspiring players hoping to make the league try out for coaches in New York City. VOA's Dili Diko has more. At this first Basketball Africa League combine, league president Amadou Gallo Fall says the goal is to give recruiters an opportunity to evaluate a deeper pool of talent. For our inaugural Basketball Africa League, uh, we are promoting, yes, local African talent, but at the same time we want to attract uh, elite global talent to create a, a very compelling basketball product on the floor. So essentially this is a uh, a recruiting you know, uh, initiative that we put together uh, for our teams to come and evaluate talent and hopefully sign them to their rosters. Players took part in athletic testing, skill development and five-on-five -five games in front of scouts, club executives and coaches. Craig Madzinski has coached in the U.S. and in Burundi. There's some very good you know, athletic talent out there, some kids with some raw skills, but also a lot of kids with sound fundamentals. You know, it's really trying to figure out what person fits the needs of a specific team or club or organization. Organizers say the goal of the Basketball Africa League is to attract top African and international talent, along with players from U.S. colleges and the NBA Developmental League. Nigerian-American point guard Yuchena Iregbu says it could be a stepping stone to the NBA. It's a great moment, it's a big moment, historic moment uh, with the, the league being brought to Africa, getting the spotlight, all the talent, so I'm, I'm glad to be a part of it. 
In partnership with the world governing body for basketball, FIBA, this is the NBA's first league outside of North America. Bai Musa Keita was scouted as a teenager in Senegal and says basketball is a life-changing sport. I'm really excited because this is, you know, like I said, it's just a going to be a great, great thing for the continent. You know, just the sports of basketball, you know, is a great pathway for me. I use it as a play. I tell the kids, I'm like, not everybody's going to go play in the NBA, but what's next? You know, this is a good way for kids to just know that, okay, but if I don't play basketball, there's a, I like to tell my story. I played basketball, got hurt, but I got my degrees. Now I'm using what I learned now to apply it in my day-to-day -day life. The 12 teams will have up to 16 players, at least eight of whom must be citizens of their respective team's home country. Four can be from other countries, and no more than two players on each team can be from outside Africa. South Sudanese center Obi Ajet says playing professionally in Africa would be a dream come true. I played here for four years in, uh, in college, and uh, in New Mexico, New Mexico, and my family, you know, didn't watch me not even at one game because it's difficult for them to actually get here. But now, if I can make this league, I can go back home and play back home and they can be able to come watch me. And that's a dream for me. Scheduled to start in March 2020, the Basketball Africa League will have teams in Senegal, Nigeria, Tunisia, Angola, Morocco and Egypt with more clubs decided by qualifying tournaments. The inaugural championship is planned for Rwanda in May. Dilidiko, VOA, New York. Thank you so much, Dilidiko. That's quite a wonderful thing for Africa. And that wraps our sports for today. And back to you, Esther. All right, Sunday. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sunday. Be sure to join Sunday Shamari again next Monday for another sports report right here on Africa 54. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a good evening.